Okay, good morning to all of you. Very glad that you're here. If you'll be making your way to your seats. We are in lesson number 13, last lesson of our first quarter of the year. Isn't that hard to believe? Next Sunday morning is lesson one in a brand new series of lessons here in the auditorium. We're going to be talking about the Beatitudes in April, May, and June. If you have not gotten a copy of lesson one for next quarter, it's already available back there. I would encourage you to get a copy of that. We're looking forward to that study that kicks off the first Sunday in March. But we're glad that you're here this morning for our last lesson in this quarter that we have titled God of Promises and Covenants. We've been trying to take a big picture approach uh, to a study uh, of what the Bible is all about and, and particularly following the thread of significant promises and covenants that God made with mankind throughout the Old and the New Testaments. We'll kind of do a little bit of review about that in just a moment, but if you'd like to open your Bible back to the book of Ephesians, turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 3, where we will read together in just a few moments. We're glad that you're here this morning, and we're looking forward to a good day together, but we want to get that day kicked off with a word of prayer. And so if you will bow with me, please, let's pray together and then we'll get into our study for the morning. Our great God and Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your high and holy name. We humble ourselves before you. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Your ways are higher than our ways. You are the God of perfect faithfulness, perfect sovereignty, you reign over all, and we humble ourselves before you this morning. We thank you for communicating with us so clearly about your eternal purpose for mankind. We thank you for the grace and the patience that you've been willing to show each one of us individually, for those who have helped us to understand your incredible promises and life-changing covenants. We pray that your blessing would be on us as we continue our study of that this morning. We thank you for your wisdom in providing the church and for all who have gathered throughout this building this morning. May the day be a day where you help us to grow in our knowledge of you and our love for you and the people around us. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that we have a risen King this morning. It's in the name of our King Jesus that we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 is where we will read together in just a few moments. As I mentioned, this is the very end of our time together in this quarter. We've tried to, as I mentioned, follow this thread from really beginning all the way to end. We could have spent the entire year following this thread. We took uh, 13 weeks, and so we have definitely hit some high points. But if you remember, we began in week number one just talking about the nature of promises. What is a promise and how promises really depend upon the character of the one who's making the promise and his or her ability to fulfill his promise, right? And we move from there to, okay, one thing to understand, a promise that's a little more every day in our interactions. But what about a, a covenant? That's something a little more substantial, quite a bit more substantial, right? That's some sort of an arrangement or an agreement based on promises. This is what you can expect from me. This is what I can expect from you. And if we do not keep our word on that front, then uh, there is some sort of a hefty consequence to that. And once we got that in our minds, the difference between a promise and a covenant and how often we run across that sort of idea in the Scriptures, we began all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 where God had promised in the day that you eat of this forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve, you shall surely die. And he had every right to make that promise, right? And yet, incredibly, he not only promises death, 
but he is the active agent. The Lord God is the one who sets out to defeat death, even before Genesis chapter 3 is done. We moved a little deeper into Genesis and found him setting his bow in the cloud, and he even uses the word covenant. He makes a covenant with mankind. A little more uh, focused, not with all of mankind like the bow, but, but particularly with this man, Abram. God makes a covenant, and we've been talking a lot more detail about that on Wednesday evening. He makes a covenant with the entire nation of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai. He makes a spectacular promise to David, right? That eventually one of your heirs is going to have a kingdom that lasts forever. We know that wasn't Solomon, right? The son of David, the next king in Israel, that God was looking forward to someone much, much more substantial. We took some time in the prophets and listened to God as he reveals his heart and how his heart is grieved over forsaken covenants. But even as it is grieved, we spent some time in Jeremiah 31 where God promised a new and a better covenant. And this is where we spend some time refreshing our, our memories that if you're a Jewish male, especially in ancient times, you're born into that covenant relationship with God, right? You are a descendant of Abraham. You're circumcised on the eighth day as a sign of that covenant that you have. And then as you grow older, you are taught who the Lord is, how to know him, how to follow his lead and obey him. But God promised through Jeremiah, the day is coming when a distinct, a new and a better covenant will be made with all. We know that he established that eternal covenant. We spent time in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 talking about that. Two weeks ago, we talked about the idea of baptism. And we listened to Paul in the book of Colossians, how he parallels that with circumcision. But this is a circumcision of the heart. This is a circumcision made without hands. And when we are baptized by faith or, or with faith into Jesus Christ, we are raised now to walk in newness of life. And God describes that with covenant language. Last week with David, you talked about the covenant of marriage. That was God's idea, of course. We wanted to, to refresh our memories about all of that and try and take a 30,000 foot view so that we can look at passages like Ephesians 3. You have your Bible open there. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11, for instance. The Apostle Paul in his letter to Ephesus says, This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. Lots there, right? But I would suggest to you that that simple sentence is a good summary of everywhere we've been this past quarter. The culmination is Jesus Christ, okay? It involves the eternal purpose of, of God, And this is one thread that we can follow to familiarize ourselves with the eternal purpose of God. What does God want us to do with that? He wants us to have faith in Jesus Christ. In order that through Jesus Christ, we might come to be in harmony with the eternal purpose of God. And so this morning... We're drawing all of this to a close by looking at how this eternal purpose comes to an end. Turn a page or two over to Ephesians chapter 5. We're talking in this last lesson about the God who has promised to return for his bride. That is really the last 
note that we have as far as God's revelation to mankind is concerned. And we get glimpses of it here and there throughout, especially the New Testament. Last week you were in Ephesians chapter 5, but I want you to read verses 25, 26, and 27 again, particularly with this idea in mind, what is God's ultimate aim or His purpose behind the sacrifice of Jesus and the cleansing of His church? In Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The question is, why? To what aim? For what ultimate purpose? Well, that's verse 26. That he might sanctify her. That he might sanctify the church, having cleansed his church by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And so let me ask you, as you think through what Paul is communicating, as you hear these various phrases, what are you thinking? Uh, that, that God has given His Son and His Son has given His life for the church. Number one, that He might sanctify her. When you hear that, what do you think of? Alan, go ahead. We have come a long, we have come a long way in this study and understanding the promise that God made and how it comes down Sin. Okay. Sin has to be removed from our soul. Great way of putting it, right? Sin is introduced in Genesis chapter 3, and God promised death, but He also promised to work to defeat death, right? And here is God dealing with sin, right? The reason that I need to be sanctified is I have been separated by God because of my sin. Sin, right? He is holy, I am not. To sanctify is to make holy again, right? God's aim for His church is that He would sanctify her. Okay, let's look at the next phrase. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word. When you hear or read that phrase, what do you think of? This is the aim of what God has done through Jesus for His church, that He might cleanse her with the washing of water with the Word. Jake, go ahead. Somewhat of a different way than how the baptism you know, washes away our sins to come in contact with the blood. Uh, in a somewhat different way, the Word... If, it change, if, it, if we allow it to affect our lives and we submit to His Word, then we will change in that way. We will be sanctified. We will be cleansed. We will be removing the dirt from us. Okay. Lots of ways that God can do that. Clearly, right? And God has chosen in His infinite wisdom to have a Word delivered to mankind. We'll talk in our, our AM assembly that His Word is the tool that He uses to transform us, right? And when we learn about His Word, I mean, why have we taken 13 weeks to try and wrap our minds around the big arc of this Word? Well, it is so that not only we would have intellectual knowledge, but that we would continue to be cleansed by that word, right? As we respond to it, as it shapes our hearts, as our consciences are pricked by it, and we do what God has told us to do in His word, it is accomplishing exactly what He wants to accomplish. Well, what does He want to do with? His church? That's the question, right? We know that He wants to sanctify us and cleanse us by the washing of water with the Word. Well, to what end? What is the aim of all of this? So that He might present the church to Himself 
in splendor. And it is spoken of in the context of a husband and a wife, right? You think about the wife as she is presented this bride to her husband and everything that the two of them are looking forward to. The church is the bride of Christ, right? And the aim of this cleansing and sanctification is that God could present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, the interesting thing is, this isn't the only place that we run across that sort of language. Go back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll just notice several of these passages. We asked in our material, all of this really is leading to perhaps the most pressing question, well, when is he going to do this? We understand that even this very morning, he is sanctifying people. He is cleansing people by the washing of water with the word, right? His invitation stands. So when is it that he is going to present the church to himself in splendor? And that's the note that we want to end this quarter on. When is Christ going to do this? We've got a few passages listed that hopefully help us work our way through that. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 2. Paul this time is writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, I feel a divine jealousy for you. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. When a mortal man says, I feel a divine jealousy for you, what in the world does he mean by that? We know Paul is not divine. We know he's flesh and blood just like you and me. And so what is it that he's describing when he says, I feel a divine jealousy for you? Dwayne? I think what he's trying to say is that this isn't a earthly husband and wife sort of thing. This is yeah. happening in that realm unknown. This, All is, right. this is a this is a holy and eternal joining, and yeah. so he, he's trying to impress upon them that this isn't a you know a husband and wife's a very <coughs> earthly thought, a, a very <coughs> human thought. Yeah. He's trying to say that that's the sort of relationship that you have entered into. Okay. Paul is a messenger, right? He's not God. He's not the bridegroom. This was not his idea. This is not his plan that revolves around an eternal purpose. Paul is a herald of this message, right? It is a message that everyone needs to hear, undoubtedly, whether they live in Ephesus or Corinth or, or beyond. This is a message from God revolving around God that ordinary people like Paul can come to share in, right? Paul is a messenger of that. Alan, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. You ever notice something there back in that verse we just studied? That God, that Paul devotes nine times more to men <coughs> and only three times for women. Paul spends a lot of time talking about this idea, undoubtedly, or, or perhaps more accurately and clearly with what we're talking about, God uses Paul much more perhaps than any other writer to, to outline exactly what he has been doing all along, right? Well, does man need more sanctifying than a woman? I think man and woman, Alan, you're trying to get me in trouble here. I think man and woman need equal sanctification, undoubtedly, right? Both Adam and Eve, ancient and modern, need sanctification, right? To, but to Duane's point, uh, God is using terms that we can very easily understand, right? In order to draw our attention to a much greater spiritual reality. Now, we began in Ephesians 5 for a reason, right? We know we're not pure. 
We know we're not holy. We know that we are in desperate need of a Savior. And yet, when we are willing to be sanctified by God, when we are willing to undergo that washing of water with the word, notice what happens. We become a part of the bride of Christ. And again, to what ultimate aim? Where is all of this leading? We have been betrothed to one husband. And the day is coming when we will be presented as a pure virgin to Christ. Okay, well, when is still our question, right? Let's go to another passage of Paul, Colossians chapter 1, a little deeper in the New Testament. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1, and notice this is not just in Ephesians, this is not just to Corinth. This is a theme that begins, begins to resonate all over the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 21. Again, here's the problem. It is a problem as old as the Garden of Eden, right? We began in Genesis chapter 3. And the same problem continues. Colossians 1.21 You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh. Who's the he? Christ, right? God with us walks among us with human flesh. Remember what Ephesians told us that he gave himself for the church. Here it is. He has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. He has reconciled us. Well, okay. What's going to happen now that we've been reconciled to God? Now that we have been washed. Now that we've been sanctified. What is it that we're looking forward to? He has done this in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Don't you see a theme beginning to develop here? Notice it is not simply Jesus has given his life for you so that you can be forgiven of your sins and live holy lives and then pass away. Each time we have noticed this idea of God has made the way available for you to be pure to what end? So that eventually you are presented before the Lord. In this context, holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Notice, if indeed you continue in the faith. One thing for me to hear this news and respond to this news, what do I need to do in order to make sure I remain a part of that pure virgin for Christ, this bride of Christ that eventually is going to be presented to God? Well, I've got to learn the faith. I've got to continue in the faith. I've got to allow that faith to make me be stable and steadfast. I've got to use that faith in order not to shift from the hope of the gospel that I heard, which has been proclaimed, Paul says, in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Key idea over and over and over again. God is holy. We're not. God is the one who has had an eternal purpose all along. He has communicated with humanity through the vehicle of his word, the faith. We, in our response to that by faith, can be made holy like he is holy. And we are waiting to be presented before him. We're still struggling with when, <laughs> right? So let's go to the very end. Go with me. Last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 19, and of course, we ought not to be surprised that this is the note on which God leads John to end this incredible word. In Revelation chapter 19, of course, we're jumping right into the latter part of an absolutely incredible vision. But for our purposes right now, John says in Revelation 19 and verse 6, I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of 
thunder and they were crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So much there. First of all, We've got a, a word picture to describe what Paul has been looking forward to in 2 Corinthians and Colossians and Ephesians. The bride is pictured as being presented before the Lamb in this context, right? Jesus, the one who gave himself. The reason he is pictured as the Lamb goes all the way back to Revelation 5, right? John sees a Lamb that has been slain, but it is he is a victorious Lamb. And no one in heaven or on earth can defeat him, right? And now at the end of this incredible revelation, we see the bride has made herself ready. The time for that pure virgin to be presented to the bridegroom has finally come. How did she make herself ready? She's dressed in fine linen, bright and pure. How is it that she came to be dressed like that? Look at the verb. I was going to say, it, it, it goes on that it's the righteous deeds of the saints. Okay. As we continue to live and to strive to be righteous, okay. that we were granted... The and this is the key word, right? The bride has not discovered this on her own. She has not achieved this on her own. She has not earned this. The fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. It is granted the bride. And again, I, I realize the, the metaphor is a little heavy for us to wrap our minds around. We're not talking about a singular person, right? We're talking about a collective noun made up of people. People are the bride. The bride is dressed in the righteous deeds of the saints. How in the world, according to Revelation, do people who have soiled their spiritual garments with sin. How is it that now their garments are bright and pure? What have they been washed in? Blood. blood. The blood of the Lamb. You see how all of that is exactly what Paul is describing in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at what God has done to teach us about promises and covenants. Well, what is all of that really leading to? What does God want of me? God wants me to learn the word. God wants me to wrap my mind around this eternal purpose that has been realized in Christ Jesus. In the very last chapter of Revelation, we hear the spirit and the bride say, come. Anyone who is thirsty, come. Anyone, right? This is available to everyone. And how does it all end? From Genesis all the way to Revelation, what's the final word? He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. The end, amen. Come Lord Jesus, that's John's addition to it, right? But you think about what God has done over the course of thousands of years. Forty different people he gets involved in revealing this revelation. Three different human languages, multiple continents, all sorts of variables. It makes sense, right, that in Genesis chapter 1, he's creator. Everything that is has come into being because he creates it. And now, thousands of chapters later, how do you end it? What's the last word? Well, here it is. 
I am coming soon. Well, it's been 2,000 years since that letter. Well, guess what? He told us toward the end of his revelation. You ought not to get tripped up in thinking of me and time the way that you think of you and time. 2,000 years might as well have been two days. Two days might as well have been 2,000 years. Time is irrelevant when we're dealing with limitations of God, right? We tried recently to wrap our minds around thousands of years in Old and New Testaments. The groom is coming again. So, let's try and put all of this together. We began in Ephesians 3 in verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's one way of looking at the arc of God's revelation and his interaction with mankind. And so as you see this, and as you think about where we've been and how the scriptures end, what does God want? Not just theoretically, not abstractly, not of someone else. What does God want of me? We began on the first Sunday in January by saying that we were going to try and, and wrap our minds around the answer to three basic questions. Who is this God? What has he done in human history? And what does he want of me? As you look at where we've been, how do you summarize that? Dwayne, go ahead. I think if you look at where we as people started, God wants a relationship with us. You know, Adam and Eve walked with him in the Garden of Eden. They communed with him. They talked with him. And it wasn't until sin entered the world that that separation occurred. And so since then, God has been trying to put us back together because he wants us to know him and have a relationship with him. Great, great way of summarizing. God is a God who desires relationship. What has he instituted and, and brought into the world in order for us to help, uh, to, to be helped to understand what relationships are? Well, he's made promises. He's made covenants. Who is he? Well, among so many other things, he's been perfectly faithful. Right? Always keeping his word. That's not us. And yet, look at what he's doing in spite of our unfaithfulness. Alan, big picture wise, how do you summarize it? I think the most important thing to learn this morning is that we must walk in newness of life to be with God again back to Garden of Eden. When I am buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life, I enter into a covenant with God. And my responsibility is to walk, my great privilege and blessing is to walk in newness of life. Any other summary thoughts? Mark, go ahead. You know, I definitely completely agree with everything that's been said so far. And like that, he wants us to take it serious. We have, we have, we see in society today that some people raising their kids, and some people treating each other is, yeah. with, without seriousness. Yeah. yeah. But he wants us to take it seriously. Look at how seriously God takes covenants. He wants us to take covenants seriously. Great thought. Paul, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, he's, it's like he made this from the beginning to the end where we just looked in Revelation mm -hmm. when it said he is coming soon. Mm -hmm. And I think he's, he's telling us, listen, I've done everything on my part to make sure you can end up with me right. as the bride of Christ. All of you. Yeah. And that coming soon is being ready. Because yeah. every one of us is only one heartbeat away from being Be ready at all times. And that we need to be prepared. Live in view of a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. That's an incredible thought, right? And, and to Paul's point, it, it can happen at any time, right? 
In the meantime, last, last note, I hope uh, that, that we can wrap our minds around. When we respond to this and live in the light of this, who gets the glory? Not me, not you, right? We didn't do anything to merit this. This is all for the sake of his name. I get incredible blessing. He gets incredible glory. And that is why we exist even this very morning. I really appreciate you being here throughout the quarter. As I mentioned, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, we're going to begin a study that will take us over the course of the next quarter through the, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And we'll look at uh, what God has done uh, for the sake of his name in a different sort of way. And lesson one is already available back there. If you haven't already gotten a copy, please be sure to get that so you're ready for our time together next Sunday morning. Thanks for being here.